my child's Good evening and welcome. I would like to thank all our members for joining us for the special evening and our webinar, Celiac Diagnosis, Holistic Approach to Heal from Inside Out. I'm Gauri Bhava, the registered dietitian on the client support desk for the Canadian Celiac Association. And I'm joined here today with Melissa Seacord, the executive director of the Canadian Celiac Association, and our revered CCA president, Janet Bolton, along with our presenter for the evening, Dustin Taut. Tonight, our plan is to walk you through to learn more about holistic approach to heal from the inside out, so as to assist you in planning the pathway towards better outcomes. As members, you know that the Canadian Celiac Association is a small national charity and for nearly 50 years, it has been led by volunteers and experts as a source for evidence-based information and peer support. We advance advocacies on issues such as safe food handling, delivery educations and services, and invest in research to empower those living with celiac disease and gluten disorders. Before we start, I would like to introduce our president for the evening, Janet Bolton. Janet is the Canadian Celiac Association's president. Janet is also currently associate vice president legal at the TD Bank Group, where she leads the TD Canadian regulatory law team. Prior to joining TD, Janet was a partner in a competition law group at Osler, Hoskin and Hartcourt LLP. Janet was called to the Ontario Bar in 1996. In addition to her legal practice, Janet is a passionate advocate for employee and community mental health. Janet has two daughters who are 18 and 16. Her husband and daughter were diagnosed with celiac disease in 2017. Since their diagnosis, Janet has committed herself to learning as much as she can about the celiac disease, gluten-free food preparations, and our medical system. Janet strongly believes in the CCA's goal of education, research, and support for individuals with celiac disease and hopes she can contribute towards these goals. Now I'd like to request Janet to say a few words to our members. Absolutely, just confirming you can hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gori, for the introduction to CCA and for my introduction. I realized my bio is a little old because my daughters are now 20 and 18. Um, I wanted just to thank everyone for participating in this seminar um, tonight, and I, I wanted to thank especially uh, Gori and Melissa for organizing, for Justine for making herself available and uh, offering this great uh, presentation to CCA members. I also just want to highlight that CCA is in the middle of making a fairly significant change. Uh, historically, CCA is really set up as a grassroots organization based on membership, um, something that you can imagine 50 years ago uh, was pretty important to find people in your community. Um, now we have all sorts of tools to find people in our communities and uh, over the last few years had fewer members. And so we made the decision, tough decision, to um, move to a donor model, move away from individual memberships. We still have lots of chapters as members and, um, and try to serve a bigger community. So we're out to support not just members, but, but all Canadians um, with celiac disease and gluten disorders. And in order to, to do that, we really do need support from donors. Um, uh, I think this webinar is a good example of the value we bring. Um, and as uh, I just want to highlight that we're almost in October and um, a, a number of us on the board as well as Melissa and uh, many others uh, in the community are going to be lacing up our shoes to participate in a big coast to coast event being hosted by Scotia Bank, uh, which is the Scotia Waterfront Marathon, but it's entirely virtual. You can pick your distance, you can do it all in, all at once or over the month of October. 
and it's uh, it's one of our biggest fundraisers. Details are on the website, and I just encourage you all to participate. We, we have a small group from last year. As you can see, I think we can easily double, triple, maybe quadruple the number of people, given that you don't even have to come to Toronto, you can do it at home. So if you're interested in being involved um, and want to uh, lace up with us or support us, please do look on our website for information. And I just stress no donation is too small. And the more people out on the road, the healthier we, all, we will all be. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, we also have some upcoming free education events that you might like to register. October 2nd, we have to, our second virtual national conference is coming up on Sunday, November 15th. Yes. And we need in the afternoon, education in the afternoon, a world-class education featuring presenters such as Trisha Thompson, the gluten-free watchdog, Shelly Case, a PAC member and a self-declared gluten-free queen who will be talking about labeling, McMaster's University's Inez Pinto Sanchez and Dr. Don, also on our professional advisory committee, chair on bone health. You also have a chance to win some great prizes from our vendors. Hooray, please join us. Visit www.ccaconference.cfcca for more details. We also have our monthly gluten-free webinars for the newly diagnosed and those seeking to learn new tips on navigating the gluten-free diet. These are generously supported by SHARS, to whom we are very thankful. Before I start, I would like to review how the webinar works. All participants are muted so that everybody can enjoy the session with minimal disruption. If you have a question for our presenter, please type them in the question and answer box. We'll get to them at the end of the presentation. I apologize in advance if we cannot get to some of the questions. You can email us with your questions at info at celiac.ca and we'd be pleased to respond. There is a chat box available for you to chat between yourselves. However, please do not ask questions in the chat box as we intend to use the questions in the question and answer box to answer all the questions for later. The sessions will be recorded, so if you would like to review the material on tonight's session, we'll email you a copy along with the PowerPoint slides. Now, on to our presenter for the evening, Justine. She's currently a CIHR-funded postdoctoral fellow working in the Faculty of Kinesiology at the University of Calgary. Her research in the area of health behavior change and she specializes in using evidence-based strategies such as self-compassion and self-regulation to improve quality of life and adherence to a gluten-free diet among people living with celiac disease. She's also a health coach who is passionate about helping people heal themselves holistically. In this talk, Justine presents evidence-based strategies to heal yourself from inside to the out after being diagnosed with celiac disease. Justine, welcome and thank you for being here. The stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. And I will just... Uh, I need to permission to share my screen. Yes, and I will stop my share. Uh, I hope I don't. Okay, there you go. Mm. We go okay welcome everyone um and uh, i'm so excited to be here with you tonight talking about a topic that i'm very passionate about um if you can grab a piece of paper and a pen i will be asking you to write some things down as we go um so uh, have somewhere to write and um and we'll get going so for those of you who saw my talk for the um at the conference back in may this will be similar in the sense that it's a bit more of a workshop so giving you ideas of different evidence-based strategies that you can use to try to help you feel better um, fast and, uh, and to effectively manage celiac disease. So I was hoping to be able to see you guys and just see where everyone is from, but um, I wonder if we'll, we'll just skip that and move on. Okay. Uh, so um, you guys, I was inter introduced well. Um, I'm right now a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Calgary. Um, my research is focusing on, focusing on self-compassion and how it can help people with managing celiac disease. 
50s. And then I've also started my own um, health coaching as well. Um, you can find out more about me at my website, just justinedow.ca. And, um, and there's lots more information there. For those of you who haven't uh, heard me talk before, um, I'll share just a little bit about my health journey and how that's fueled uh, my interest in celiac disease. So I was diagnosed with celiac disease almost a decade ago. And um, I've been through a number of ups and downs in trying to manage the disease. It became complicated by Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I'd often be in so much pain that I'd have to lie on my office floor until the stomach pain passed and just didn't know what was causing it for a long time. And then for over two years, um, my husband and I struggled with fertility issues that also turned, turned out to be tied to gut health. Um, and we finally found out our answers were um, related to autoimmune infertility. And um, there's more information on this uh, in my book on my website, or feel free to send me a direct message and uh, email, and I'm happy to, to help you if you're navigating that as well. In learning to cope with my health struggles, I became interested in Creston Neff's work on self-compassion and mindfulness, and this has helped me personally um, as I started to explore the role of self-compassion in chronic disease populations, such as celiac disease. So through all of these experiences, I've become so passionate about my own gut health and then also helping to empower others to optimize theirs as well. So as we get started tonight, um, I invite you to take just about a minute now and think about what is the biggest thing that you're struggling with in terms of your digestive health, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, or social, what is it that you're struggling with the most? And just take a minute to write this down. Maybe it's all of these areas. Just taking a minute to reflect on this and what seems uh, what's coming up for you. Okay, so we'll be coming back to this at the end of the talk. So keep, keep whatever you wrote down handy. Um, I do need to just uh, add a disclaimer that the statements in this presentation have not been approved by the FDA or Health Canada. The information is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. And so you need to assume full responsibility for how you use the information. I always encourage people to consult with their physician or healthcare professionals before making any diet or lifestyle changes. So now I'd like to move on to a quick poll. Were you able to get this working? Melissa or Quendi? There we go. Okay, so the poll should have popped up on your screen. There's two questions there. I'd love um, to, if you can just open the first two. Um, we'll come back to the third and fourth ones next time, or a little bit later. If everyone can just respond to the first two, that would be great. I think it'll be up for about a minute, and then, uh, and then it'll get closed. Okay, it sounds like you have you do have to answer them all. Um, so uh, so you're welcome to answer three and four, um, and it's okay if those answers change for next time. Um, but if you can answer all four, so that we can move on, that would be great. Three and four just might make a little more sense once we get there in the talk. Okay, and I think those will be up for about 20 more seconds. And then uh, can you close that please to the hosts? You want me to close them now? Uh, yeah, just about five more seconds if people are finishing up, that would be great, thank you. Yes.
Okay, so we'll get that closed and then uh, the answers will pop up. You can share them, I think, once, once it comes together. Okay, so most people have been diagnosed for over 10 years. Um, okay, and most people are, feel like they're doing okay, but could use some guidance um, or managing pretty well. This is helpful. Okay, sleep is important, diet. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for participating. That helps me just tailor the information that I'm uh, sharing with you now. So tonight, here's the outline of what we'll be talking about. Um, so the first part is about it starts with you. And so we're going to be talking about mindset, sleep, nourishing your body with food, um, cultivating joy, and then move more. So exercise. And then the second part, I truly believe that it's so important to have um, a team around you that can help you. Um, so in terms of a dietitian, doing regular checkups, as well as um, alternative care practitioners and the role that they can play. So we're going to start with part one. And so this first part, um, my guess is that it sounds like a lot of you have been diagnosed for over 10 years or at least um, five to eight. And, um, and then you're also feeling like you're struggling a little bit and need some help with some things. So there's probably some frustration in there, and I've been there too, where you feel like you're trying everything, you're doing it, and uh, sometimes you can feel like just nothing is working, and it can start to be this spiral downwards where um, you're starting to feel stressed out, and then that makes your gut health worse, um, and then you get more frustrated and you try different things and just don't know where to go or what to do. So I'm hopeful that these different evidence-based strategies tonight will resonate with you. And um, sorry, you might be able to hear my little voice in the background. I apologize for that. <laughs> Benefits of working from home. Um, and um, so the, the, this frustration is unfortunately actually making it worse. And this is because of the gut-brain connection. We do know from the research that there is a very strong connection between stress management and digestive health. The latest research shows that uh, stress is a strong predictor of flares for people with um, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, as well as celiac disease. Um, and an interesting study that I just came across actually was about um, hypervigilance and the gluten-free diet. Um, and this is somewhat in contrast to other research showing that we do know following a strict gluten-free diet is important for quality of life, but there seems to be a fine line between being vigilant and very hypervigilant. And that this can actually lead to poor quality of life when we're just overstressing about um, about what we're eating. And, and I get it, we don't wanna feel sick, but there's gotta be a fine line and kind of a gentleness that we take towards this so that it's not making things worse. So one of the first places that I start with my clients is simply with mindfulness um, and deep breathing. And so there's more and more research in this area showing how practicing can help with a variety of conditions, in particular, digestive distress. Um, and so what we simply do is just take a couple of deep breaths so I encourage all of you, no matter what's going on in your world right now, just taking a couple of moments right now to bring your attention to your breath. So I often close my eyes and then I think about the air coming in through my nose, deep into my stomach, and then noticing it go out my mouth or my nose, whatever feels more natural. You might notice in your mind jumping to different places, but just remind yourself to bring your attention back to your breathing. And this is the simple practice of mindfulness. So when we're practicing mindfulness, um, we're focusing on our breathing. And so this activates our parasympathetic nervous system. And this can really help with calming your system, reducing. And so the vagus nerve starts in the brain and it's called a wandering nerve because it has multiple branches um, and it wanders throughout the body. It touches on the heart, lungs, and the digestive tract. And this is a bi-directional connection. So this is why when, um, 
when we're emotionally upset, we often feel physical symptoms in our guts, nausea, um, an upset stomach, constipation, or diarrhea, but it also works the other way too. If our guts are upset from food or underlying issues, it can really impact our mental health as well. We do know that there's a strong connection between gut health and mental health. So tonight we'll be talking about how stress can impact our guts. And we have two different options. We can, um, because sorry, when, uh, when we are stressed, this activates the sympathetic nervous system. And so in this heightened state, the body cannot focus on rest and digest. And so this can potentially lead to long-term digestive health issues, sleep issues, um, and overall stress and anxiety. So we have two options. We can reduce life stress or figure out how to cope with the stressors. And I truly believe that both are so important. We want to reduce stressors in our life, simplify as much as possible, but it's life and there just will be stressors that happen. And so these strategies that I'm talking about tonight will hopefully help you to cope with what comes up in life. So let's look a, look up a bit at this cycle of stress. So when we feel stress, the brain senses this, um, and then it leads to a uh, release of cortisol. And in the short term, this is important. This helps us in responding to whatever the stressor is. But if it's released over the long term, it can lead to um, long-term suppression of immune function, important um, neurotransmitters, serotonin and melatonin, um, gut motility and digestive processes as well that can just go down. And so this is why gut health and mental health um, start to deteriorate when we're chronically stressed. But there are things that we can do. So if we want to reduce this negative um, impact of stress, what we can do is follow um, a healthy diet, get regular exercise and sleep, um, have meditation practice. And so this can stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which promotes rest and digest, and then that decreases pain and anxiety. Um, and then we have improved immune function, improved release of serotonin and melatonin production, um, and improvements in gut motility and other digestive processes. So then this helps with reducing stress and this whole cycle just starts to get better and we feel better. Um, I know for me, if I'm feeling stressed out, sleep and digestive health are the first two to go. So how do we start to really cope with stress? We do know um, from, from my research, I've specifically been focusing on self-compassion and celiac disease. And we found that self, people who practice more self-compassion are actually um, predicts better quality of life and adherence to a gluten-free diet. So that was a study we did a couple of years ago. And we also know that it's a skill that can be learned. So this is an online intervention study that we uh, are just in the, uh, works of finishing publishing. Um, and so this is really exciting because it shows we can teach people with celiac disease how to be more kind and caring to themselves. So watch for more of this uh, coming from me for specific ways to help you with that. Um, but simply where to start. I love to start with just a simple moment of self-compassion. Let's first talk a bit about what exactly is self-compassion. So self-compassion is simply giving the same kindness to ourselves that we would give to others. It involves self-kindness versus self-judgment, common humanity versus feeling isolated, um, mindfulness versus over-identification. So when we practice self-kindness, this is simply being kind and caring to ourselves um, rather than being harshly uh, judgmental. Common humanity is reminding ourselves that we're not the only person in the world who's gone through whatever we're going through. I often tell myself I'm not the only celiac um, who's had ongoing digestive struggles. It's normal, um, but we also can do things to help us feel better. But when we don't feel so isolated, it can help it not be so overwhelming. And then mindfulness refers to the way that we relate to situations with non-judgment um, and acceptance. And that's where this deep breathing can really come in. But let's take you through a practice of actual self-compassion. So I'd like everyone to close their eyes and take a deep breath. Think about a big struggle, maybe what you wrote down at the beginning with your digestive health. See if you can find the discomfort in your body. Where do you feel it the most? Some people feel it tight in their stomach, often with celiac disease, that's where we do. Sometimes it's tight in their shoulders or in their chest, maybe a busy racing mind. Whatever it is, just notice how your body's dealing with this stress, how your body's reacting. And now say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. This is really difficult. 
And this is simply being mindful. You can also say, ouch, this hurts. This is really tough. But suffering is part of living. It's part of common humanity. Everyone does feel discomfort at some point in time. And now I invite you to take one hand and place it over your heart. Feel the gentle pressure and warmth of your hand. Feel free to place both hands on your chest and just notice the difference between one and two hands. Some people feel uneasy with their hands on their heart. So feel free to explore other possibilities, such as crossing your arms to give yourself a gentle squeeze. And now say to yourself, may I accept myself as I am? May I give myself the compassion that I need? May I forgive myself? May I be strong? May I be safe? If these words don't feel right to you, think of what you may say to a close friend or a loved one who's struggling and just noticing how you feel. This feeling is part of what's involved in being self-compassionate and it's a basic way of giving yourself love in the form of soothing touch. So this is something that I've used when I was gluten before and it was a really awful experience, but I noticed that the more that I was ruminating about things, the worse that I was making my stomach and my whole body feel. And so simply giving myself compassion and treating myself like I would one of my boys if they were hurt really helped. And, um, and so I just encourage you to choose some of the words that resonate with you and try to use it in the future um, when you're going through difficult times. This is actually a practice that I use on a daily basis. Um, so in the morning, it helps me get focused before work, just simply checking in and seeing how my body's doing, asking myself what I need. It can last 30 seconds or 30 minutes. To, it's totally modifiable for what, um, what you need. You can use it when you're triggered um, from a variety of different situations that, that we go through when, uh, when we're struggling with gut health issues. So moving on to the next piece that I know a number of you, the majority of you are saying that you're struggling with sleep. Um, so when, uh, when we do sleep well, it seems that everything just falls into place a little bit more easily. We're able to deal with the ups and downs um, and things just don't feel as um, insurmountable when, when difficult things do come up. As someone who just overcame a brutal bout of insomnia over the summer can definitely attest to this. But I've also done a ton of research and, um, and learned about this personally and professionally. So I'm excited to share a little bit of what I learned with you tonight. So we do know from the research that poor sleep and insomnia are very common among GI patients. One of the latest studies that I found um, showed that 75%, so one, uh, three quarters of people who have IBS have report poor sleep. 60% um, of people with celiac disease report poor sleep um, and 50% of people with IBD or irritable bowel or inflammatory bowel disease reported as well. So this is extremely common. Um, and this is, these numbers were not quite as high, but very similar for specific clinical insomnia. So 50% of people with IBS struggling with that. One in three people with celiac disease struggling with insomnia and 27% um, and of people with IBS. So please, first of all, tell yourself you are not alone and there is something that can be done. You don't have to struggle. There are sleep techniques and strategies that can help you to feel better. So a couple of the tips that I want to start with tonight. Number one, talk to your healthcare provider. See if something else is going on. Um, and then also consider asking them about a magnesium supplement. We do know that magnesium can be low in people with celiac disease um, and it's linked to sleep. So this is something that I really encourage everyone to talk to um, their doctor or dietitian about and seeing if this is appropriate for you. In terms of behaviors, one hour wind down before bed is so, so, so crucial. Um, and so thinking about what this really looks like for you, is it taking a bath, um, making sure everything, all of the potential stimulants are out of the way, um, out, of, uh, out, of right, out of reach, out of sight, out of mind. Um, maybe it's watching a TV show that's just light and doesn't get you too excited about anything, um, like the debate. <laughs> um, whatever it is, just really encourage you to think about this because it is such an important piece of telling your body, okay, it's time to relax, I'm getting ready for sleep. And then cognitions are so important, so are thoughts. And now the first step is simply just becoming aware of our thoughts. 
So I encourage people to start with recording them. What are they? Um, are you often, I know when I was really struggling, I would think, oh, I'm never going to sleep again. This is absolutely awful. I'm going to be a disaster tomorrow. All of these things. And it's so easy to spiral downwards when we think this way. However, it doesn't have to be like this. Um, so first step is recording them and then reflecting on them. First of all, challenge yourself. Are these cognitions actually correct? The research actually shows that you just need five and a half hours of core sleep to not um, de have detrimental effects on your behavior for the day. Um, and people are able to maintain this for a couple of months. So just reminding yourself that you can function. You might not feel your absolute best, but you can function. Um, and so as someone with two little boys at home, I definitely have a lot of ups and downs with my sleep. But some of these simple things that I can tell myself really, really help. Um, and the behaviors. So one of the most key things is uh, this 30-30 rule. And so this is that if you've been lying in bed, um, relaxing and sleep hasn't come yet to get out of bed, it's been 30 minutes. So obviously you're not lying there staring at the clock. Um, but if you know it's been quite a while, get out of bed, go to another room, pull out a book, pull out a puzzle, something that um, is low key, but that will help you to um, relax and give yourself a full 30 minutes out of bed and then reset and try to go back to bed. Um, for anyone who sleep trained a baby, it's very similar <laughs> to that idea. Um, if you've got more questions, I'm happy to, to talk about that, but those are just a couple of the little ones um, that I found to be very effective in helping to get my sleep back on track. Nourishing your body. Food is so, so important. Um, and one of the uh, latest studies, there's a number of studies looking at what's the best diet. Um, and so there have been a few that have been talking about the numerous beneficial effects of the Mediterranean diet um, on the gut microbiome. So leading to beneficial composition of um, the types of um, microorganisms that are living in the gut. So how do we actually start with this? So really focusing on a variety of plants. Um, some dietitians that I work with recommend trying to get 30 different types of plant-based foods into your diet over the week. This can seem like a lot, but this is so beneficial because it helps, um, it helps feed the different microorganisms in your gut. And when you're feeding them different foods, each one food feeds off of a different food. So when we eat a variety of things, this helps feed the different types of bacteria in your gut. Um, and as we're doing that, that will increase our fiber, which for most people, this is really helpful. If you know you're someone who doesn't do well with a lot of fiber, again, reach out to a dietitian to help you get the right recommendation there. But for many people, this is a really good starting point. Um, and if you're trying to work towards that big number of 30, one way that can help um, is this two, three, four goal. So at breakfast, trying to have two different types of plant-based foods, um, vegetables, and that's what I aim for in, in breakfast, three at lunch at four at dinner. Um, and, or you, you might adjust those numbers if you have snacks in the middle, but this is a good way to really start to increase um, consumption of plants and fiber that are all so important for gut health. And I really encourage people to think about what makes you feel good. So reflecting on, okay, so we might have craved that gluten-free, cheesy um, a macaroni and cheese, um, but how did it make you feel afterwards? And maybe next time, just asking yourself, okay, what's the minimum amount that I can be satisfied with? so that you might not feel terrible um, the next time. And if you just have a little bit, maybe your body will be okay with it. Um, whatever you can, uh, just ask yourself and think about that. And in terms of a resource, I have a whole list of resources that I'll send you at the end as well, but I absolutely love this podcast. It's called Let's Get Real. Um, one of my colleagues is a registered dietitian and she started um, running it and it's just um, awesome. And I've learned so much from it. And so this episode I'm recommending um, is related to uh, the topic of the Mediterranean diet, but there are so, she's got about 25 now, and I really recommend it um, if you'd like to learn more. So moving on to joy. And I think that unfortunately joy is one of the first things that goes when we're struggling with any sort of health thing. Um, when we're struggling with our gut health, it's all we can think about, particularly if it's really severe. Um, I know I've been there, um, but we also know that when we can cultivate joy, it is an independent predictor of subjective well-being. So of our happiness, how we're doing. So where do we start? 
what I do recommend is, um, and we know from the research that having this attitude of gratitude is so important for helping us um, to feel joy. So when we're grateful for things in our life, this um, helps us to feel joy and appreciate the other positive things that happen in our life. So um, ways to to become more grateful is uh, having a journaling practice so in the morning or at night, writing down what you're grateful for, or maybe different types of meditations that really center around gratitude. Uh, and then the next, piece, the next piece is about prioritizing self-care. So maybe it's that bathtub, maybe it's a client I was working with, she's getting married and um, she just really wanted to give herself permission to read her wedding uh, magazines for an hour because she was just procrastinating everything else in her life and struggling with gut health. And so when we give ourselves permission to do what our body's truly asking for, um, it's incredible at how far that can get you. Okay, and now on to the last piece of uh, part one, and this is move more. So I'm sure all of you are probably aware that um, for optimum health benefits, we really want to focus on regular physical activity. And Health Canada recommends 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise. So breaking this down to about 30 minutes a day and a variety of aerobic, strength training, and stretching. So where to start? I really encourage people to um, think about what they like to do because that's the num one of the biggest predictors of actual future behavior is enjoyment of it. So if you're pushing yourself because you think you should go do spin classes, but you hate them, don't do that. Let go of that. Give yourself permission to do what you love. So for example, and then to schedule it. So for example, this is what my week looks like this week. Um, and it's a variety of different things, but I find it so, so helpful um, that on Sunday I sit down and I schedule it in so that it actually happens. Otherwise I find that it's so easy to, it just other things take over and it doesn't, it's not a priority, but we know that it helps people feel better. Um, and I do wanna share the findings from some recent published research. So some of you might've heard me talk about the MOVE-C study. So this is, um, we're looking at the relationship between the microbiome, vitality and exercise and celiac disease. So it was a 12 week exercise on holistic lifestyle program. Um, they came, participants came in to do two weekly exercise sessions and then six bi-weekly holistic education sessions. And we published the study protocol. And then just recently, finally, um, we published the findings from uh, the gut health piece. So we actually did stool sample analysis and looked at changes in the gut of people who were in the HIT, the exercise program, and compared that to those who were in the um, weight loss control. And so we did find beneficial effects on the gut microbiome in uh, people with celiac disease who did the high intensity interval training. So this is really exciting. It shows that we can do something about it. So for all of you who feel like you're missing something, I encourage you to ask yourself if you are regularly active, because this is showing that there are some potential benefits um, specific for you with celiac disease and gut health. Now, it's such a new area of research. We don't know exactly all of the effects and how this works, um, but potentially beneficial shifts is something that's great, especially because we know there are so many benefits to being active on a regular basis. So we're going to do the other poll, but um, this was just asking all of you which one you needed most help, most help with. And at the beginning, um, it sounds like it was sleep. So if we've got more questions about that, I'm happy to address it at the end. Um, and now in the second part, so part two, so the first part was really about what you can do yourself. And now I truly believe it's so important to build your team of healthcare providers, people that you trust, people who are really on your team and who believe that you can and deserve to feel your best. If you don't jive with your doctor or your dietitian, reach out and find someone new because there are so many great people out there um, who do want to help you feel better. And sometimes it's just a personality thing, a strategy, whatever it is. Um, just really encourage you to not feel stuck because there are so many options. So I just want to share a couple of um, resources. Um, these are dietitians across Canada who are celiac specific or digestive health um, experts. And um, some are specifically associated with the CCA, but I suggest you check them out um, because I know they are all great. 
And then the second piece um, is having regular checkups. So you really do have to be an advocate for your own health. Some doctors might be aware of it, others might not be. And so there's a great resource on the celiac website about management resources for physicians. And so this talks about um, the different uh, follow-up um, assessments that should be done at different time points following your diagnosis. And then finally, this was the area that uh, there was a lot of interest in as well. So this complementary and alternative care. So it's very important to use caution when working with alternative care providers. We really need to be wary of false or unproven claims. Um, a recent study found that 60% of CAM clinics made false or unproven claims across North America. Um, this is really unfortunate because I do really believe in them and I work with them myself. Um, but one of the ones that often came up was that about celiac disease, that it could be cured. So if you're finding a practitioner and it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, and just listen to your gut on that and, um, and think about does, does what they're saying make sense? Um, however, at the same time, like I just mentioned, I do believe in uh, complementary, complementary and alternative care. And I do see different providers myself. Um, for example, with acupuncture, from the research, we do know that it can have beneficial effects on insomnia. Um, you can't see me right now, but I actually have these little ear seeds and it's really helping with my sleep. Um, specific, these little acupressure points in my ears, and that's been a huge piece of helping me sleep better. Um, and this is consistent with the research. And we do know um, that acupuncture might also provide relief um, when compared to particularly in comparison to medications for people with IBS, um, so relieving some of the GI symptoms that they're feeling. And then there's also some really neat research showing the benefits of hypnotherapy, um, specifically for people with IBS, which we know can be really common in people with celiac disease. So I just highlight these different areas so that you can um, really start to build out your team, ask yourself, what does my body need? Um, and, then, and then start to build that team there. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions um, or would like some referrals for people in this area. I'm really excited to share that I actually have an ebook that's going to be coming out um, this fall, and it's um, just a lot more information than uh, what I was able to include in this talk tonight. So please just send me an email. Um, it's going to be free for a limited time, so um, you can sign up for my newsletter or send me an email if you'd like to be on that list. In terms of other resources, um, got to promote my own blog, um, as well as the Let's Get Real podcast. Um, Andrea Hardy is a great resource. In terms of sleep, if you haven't come across the Calm app yet, and I don't get any money from promoting this, but I just use this religiously, um, check out the Dr. Orma Sleep Science um, talk. It is awesome, and it, uh, it helped me a ton. Um, that's where a lot of my recommendations come from um, for sleep. So I do check that out. In terms of exercise, move more. Um, CSEP is, um, exercise, these are the exercise guidelines for Canadians and there's different recommendations there as well. The link for follow-up after diagnosis, um, it's here and you'll be getting um, this email to you as well if, uh, if you can't find it on the Celiac website. Now, just to wrap everything up before we start answering questions, I love to goal set. Anyone who's been to my talks before, we're always setting goals. So I want to um, invite you to reflect on what, you're, what you wrote down at the beginning um, in terms of what was your biggest struggle with gut health, uh, your, what's going on for you. And now just think about what's your goal? Where do you want to get to? And then as you get that written down, um, I invite you to just think about how you're actually going to get there. So the first action plan you're gonna create. Over the next month, I will do X in order to help with my digestive health. Over the our next week, so break it down even further from the month, um, for the next week, what will you do there? Um, there's a question. I do believe that the recording will be posted um, for members to access um, afterwards. And I will also be sending out um, just a worksheet that has the links to these things as well, if uh, you weren't able to write those down.
Okay, so as people are finishing that up, we can start to answer some questions. Thank you so much for all of your attention tonight and participating. Thank you very much for the comprehensive overview, Justine. I am sure it was immensely helpful. Just a quick reminder, please make sure to join our CCA moderated Facebook group if you already haven't, because I know a lot of our members are there and we get a lot of great feedback on how we are doing. And check out our YouTube channels for the past educations that have been done by registered dietitians, doctors. We recently had a pediatrician with us, so they're all there on the Canadian Celiac Association's YouTube channel. Other things that can be done, you can call me, the registered dietitian at the client support desk, leave a voicemail, or if you want to speak to me in person, call on Thursday, I'm in office. Otherwise, I will get back to you. You can also email me at clientsupport at celiac.ca. And so, on to questions. Um, our first question for the evening is, please give examples of plants to eat. Great question, Valerie. Thank you so much. Um, so these are vegetables, um, things like, uh, and plant-based protein. So quinoa, um, all different types of vegetables, root vegetables, potatoes, um, yams, peppers, lettuce, um, anything. And these, think of plants that grow in a garden versus meat-based diets is what I mean. Okay, that's great. Any other questions? How do dietitians help? Catherine, that's a great question. And the CCA might be able to um, elaborate on that, but um, they can help in a variety of different ways. So many people are often struggling with trying to figure out, okay, where are these symptoms coming from? What's going on? I'm following a strict gluten-free diet. Um, I don't understand why am I feeling crummy? And um, so dietitians can really help with breaking that down, help you figure out uh, which foods do trigger you. Um, and then also the dietitians work towards helping you eat a varied diet, really moving away from these restrictive diets that are stressful and not beneficial for your gut health, but they can help you to really sort through and figure out um, what are the triggers for your digestive um, concern, uh, concerns. Um, and also they'll be able to flag if you need to talk to a GI specialist to rule out other things that might be going on. Another question. I do stretches in the morning. Does that count as a part of workouts? Oh, stretches are so great. And I think that um, if it's something you find enjoyable and it's relaxing and it feels good, we do know it's an important part of, of exercise um, and being active. I do encourage people to really try to get a variety of things in. Um, and we know that intensity is important too. So it's great. I do yoga once a week and that feels wonderful. But at the same time, we also want to get some of that moderate to vigorous intensity exercise in, depending on what your body can handle. Um, if we're really struggling with different health issues, you might only have light. But for the majority of the healthy population, um, that moderate to vigorous intensity is where you're going to start to see more health benefits. Any recommendations on multivitamins for women and kids, preferably no sugar added? Thank you. Sorry, Tanya, I can't, uh, I can't make recommendations for that, but I can let the CCA uh, make those recommendations. Yes, and uh, as per dietitians, we always say, uh, talk to your physician, get your blood tests down, get a borderline of how all your nutrients are doing, and then go in for multivitamins because we are like, we should try and incorporate as many foods as possible, but as and where required, a multivitamin should always be started after getting your baseline so that you know how long you need to take it because it is not necessary that you may be deficient in one and that you need it. You might just be able to fulfill it with food, which is a much better alternative. Great, thank you. And then we have, I do push-ups and planks too. Mm, that's wonderful, Sylvie. Those are great. Those are the strength, uh, strength training things that we're talking about. So, um, and then and then looking to incorporate some cardio would be a great way to round out that routine. And there's a question: Do probiotics help? <laughs> that's a very. Uh, Good question. And, um, you know, there's, there is starting to be a lot of research out there showing um, beneficial effects of probiotics, but it's so important to, um, to, again, that's something dietitians can help with. 
um, I know about that, but I can't make recommendations there. But we do know there's lots of research showing specific probiotics that can help with IBS um, and with helping people who are struggling with immune function um, and other sorts of um, health concerns. And if you actually listen to that Let's Gut Real podcast, it's maybe the first or the second one um, where it's all about probiotics. And uh, I recommend you go there first. Definitely. And then my biggest problem has been fluctuating bowels from loose to constipation. I have reduced fiber as much as I love it. Any suggestions? Mm. Um, thank you. It's, that's such a, a, such a tough call there. Um, that, uh, again, um, I can't, I can't help with that because it's not my dietitian expertise. I do. That's why I do recommend, um, talking to a dietitian to figure these sorts of specific things out. Um, but my, I believe that there, there should be some dietary things that can help you. And again, that's why a dietitian, um, they're trained to sort and figure that out. Uh, do you have others in your family that have celiac disease and how do you cook meals for everyone? Mm, that's a great question. So I do, my mom and my brother, my sister, we all have celiac disease. And so fortunately that makes uh, family events pretty easy because everything is gluten-free. Well, my two little boys don't have celiac disease so far, but we do know from the research that it's important to incorporate a small amount um, to try to reduce the amount uh, or to reduce the chances of them developing it and so our house is about 95 percent gluten free um and if we do have gluten for my boys um it'll be something that i can contain really easily so like a pasta we're super careful about um the cross-contamination piece and, and keeping my food very separate um but if you have does that help barbara do you have more specific questions that about uh, cooking meals for everyone? No, I don't see, yeah, I do see a question come up. What kind of magnesium works best for anxiety and insomnia? What dose? Should I have a blood test to determine if my level is too low? Um, so different types of magnesium work for different people. Um, and again, that's why I do recommend you talk to your healthcare provider. Um, I really can't, uh, I can't make this recommendation uh, for you at this level, but I think if you're the same person who was talking about the bowels, that, that could be something going on there as well. Just talking to your healthcare provider to find the right time. So there's magnesium glycinate and magnesium citrate. Different types are given depending on more of your clinical picture there. Same with dose. And, um, and I would just recommend you talk to them. Sorry, I can't give more specific information there. I keep noticing new things. I'm intolerant to. Was diagnosed with celiac six years ago and eat a varied gluten-free diet with 80% home-cooked meals. Is this normal for people with celiac? Hmm. Um, we'd have, have quite a few more questions for you, Hannah, but I think big picture, we do know that people with celiac disease are, it's IBS, can, irritable bowel syndrome can be very common um, among people uh, with celiac disease. And so again, that's where really working with a specialized dietitian can be really helpful. Um, I do, if you guys haven't seen yet, um, I do have an app called uh, My Healthy Gut. You can get it in the iTunes store. And so that can be a place to start. It's really helpful with recording what you're eating and the foods um, that you are uh, um, eating and then recording your um, sort of symptoms afterwards. And that can make it really helpful when you go and talk to the dietitian to see what's going on. Have you seen any correlation between celiac disease and the development of lipomas? Lipomas. I, I can't comment on that. Yes, for that, you will definitely go and have to talk to your gastroenterologist so that he can look into it. If you are having a development of lipomas, your gastroenterologist and your physician needs to look into it further. Uh, when will My Healthy Gut be available on Android? It looks like a great app. Oh, thanks, Hannah. It is. I'm sorry that it's not yet. We've been working on getting funding. It's been really tough. Um, so I, I honestly can't say. I'm sorry. But um, uh, you can check out the website or reach out to one of the dietitians. Um, that uh, that's part of it as well. That's Desiree Nielsen. Okay. What is the cons what is the story on gluten hanging in the gluten flower hanging in the air? Is this a real concern? 
That is a good question. I don't know that I know the latest research on that. Um, I think that when people are at a um, in a bakery, uh, that there there is the risk there, and so I personally would be extremely careful about that. Um, I don't know if you know more specific information. Um, what do you? Yes, we do say that if you're going to be in a in an area that has long term use of. Uh, gluten flowers and they're hanging in the air, then you definitely need to wear a mask and be sure you're not doing cross contamination and inhaling. But if it's a short term, like you're doing a small cake in the home or a batch of cookies, then I don't think it should be a very big concern because it's not hanging, there's not a lot of flour hanging in the air for a very long term. So, I great questions, see. everyone. Thank you. Um, and then Yvonne, there was another question about flour and dishes in the house from gluten flour. Um, there was an, a neat study that came out um, in one of the recent uh, newsletters from the CC, I think maybe about six months ago, and it was looking at cross-contamination, um, specifically in toasters and um, toasters and pots from pasta, that sort of um, a variety of different areas and so we can link send a link to that as well if you want to look at the different uh, findings that they found there yes so okay i think we've covered most of the question oh another one yes thank you everyone and um, that's a lot of questions and really interesting ones and if you enjoyed tonight's presentation I would request you to please consider making a donation to help us continue delivering our programs. I would also now like to thank all our members who have supported us through this journey. And I would like to thank our presenter for the evening, Justine, our president, Janet, and director, Melissa Secord, for joining us all mm -hmm. here today. We will continue to strive and bring forward as many education sessions we can on however topic, whatever topics you would like us to do. I in CCA would now like to wish you health and happiness and stay safe. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, my pleasure. <laughs>